Thank you, loving Father, for the privilege of being members of your royal family. Thank you for the grace which has made it all possible and for that grace which provides for us throughout all time and eternity. Bless our study together and help us to understand the things of which we, at which we look for the glory of God, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Open the word of truth, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In our study of Galatians chapter 1, we have come to the study of the, the church. And uh, it will be a actually a an appendix in the book on Galatians but as soon as we finish it uh, we will be putting it out in a handbook form so it'll be found both in the doctrinal handbook form and it will also be in as an appendix in the book Galatians chapter 1 because the the subject is extremely important and most believers are totally ignorant. People think that just because somebody puts up a building and calls it the church of whatever, that it's a church. Well, it's a gathering of people. Sometimes it's a gathering of unbelievers. Many times it's a gathering of unbelievers. But even if it's not unbelievers, many times they don't understand the whole principle regarding what the church is all about. And we're, we have been talking about the very, very important principle uh, of the distinction between Israel and the church because we're actually dealing with a very, very uh, important principle, and that is the doctrine of dispensationalism. Now, I know there are people who are critical of me because I take time to teach doctrines like this which do not have practical implication of where the rubber meets the road. That is, it doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do when your wife hits you on the head with a frying pan. It doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do when the boss comes in and curses you upside down for something you didn't do. It doesn't uh, tell you which way to turn as you walk out of your house in the morning and uh, how to get to work uh, uh, the, the, in the will of God. It doesn't, it's, it's so, as they say, it is impractical. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible is very, very clear that on everything that is practical in the Christian way of life is based upon a doctrinal foundation, a strong doctrinal foundation. And today, there's a tremendous schism in the church between the people who are called covenant theologians and those who are dispensationalists. Now, we talked on Sunday that just because somebody divides time into periods does not mean they're dispensationalists. That is an error that has been made by multitudes of people. You see, you go to a bookstore, and there's a, they have, they're, they're masters. They put out fantastic covers and some magnificently clever titles, and Christians go in just like a stupid fish, and they take the bait, hook, line, and sinker, and swallow it, and now they have something that's uh, in their soul that has no business being there because it was written by some idiot who doesn't teach the truth. Just because it's in a Christian bookstore or comes from the so-called church doesn't mean it's doctrinally correct. And it's all right if you're spiritually advanced and you are uh, looking for uh, the, the principles of apologetics for you to study what the other side believes. Certainly, there's nothing wrong with that so long as you understand what you believe first of all and understand it so that you're not going to be easily swayed by every wind of doctrine that comes along. Young people are so stupid that 
you say to you say to a young person, well, uh, uh, this this boy, this guy that uh, this hunk that you're going with, is he a Christian? Uh, duh, he goes to church. Like that meant something. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. He goes to church. Well, for goodness sake, what does that mean? And just because he goes to church, it may mean a lot of things. It may mean he's a Christian, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's a Christian just because he goes to church. What does it make? What kind of a church? And then your kids will come home to you and they'll say, oh, why don't we have a, a, a program for our young people like they have at the First Church of the Frigidaire? Where they, uh, they play spiritual ring around the rosy. And they, uh, they play twinkle toes with each other. And they play uh, photography. That's where you turn off the lights and see what develops. But they play all kinds of those uh, goody things. And, and we don't do that at our church. All we do is study doctrine. Well, there's a point in it. There's a purpose for it. There's a reason for it. And one of the characteristics that's very, very important is to understand the distinction between Israel and the church. And we spent Sunday, we talked a great deal about the first major point uh, in, the, uh, in this, uh, the principle of the distinction between Israel and the church. And we went through the uh, seven uh, dispensations or the seven periods of time and we concluded by simply pointing out that uh, the dispensations or the, di the division of time from the beginning of time to the end of time into periods does not change the way of salvation. That the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the basis of salvation in every dispensation, whether it was from Adam and Eve to the end of the, the millennial kingdom, the basis of salvation for every age is faith in the second person of the Godhead. The second person of the Godhead is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, uh, uh, the Jesus and Christ are both Greek words. They couldn't have come into existence until the Greek language was invented. Therefore, if somebody would have said to Adam and Eve, believe on Jesus Christ, they wouldn't have had the slightest idea what he's talking about because Jesus and Christ are two words that didn't come into existence until uh, many, many, many hundreds of years later. But they saw a coat of skins and uh, the coat of skins was given to them by God to cover their nakedness and the coat of skins spoke of the lamb which would one day be slain that was a revelation of the second person of the Godhead and they were saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as he was revealed to them the Old Testament sacrifices of Moses uh, represent the Lord Jesus Christ everything from the uh, the uh, the the lamb or the bullock to the dove to the uh, uh, meal offering that was free of of its uh, of leaven all of those spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ but again long before the language uh, that contained the name Jesus Christ was recorded but the object of faith has always been the second person the revealed person of the Godhead the content of faith will change in every dispensation so that they're, they weren't saved. Adam and Eve had no idea that there was going to be a cross. I Don't listen to anybody who tells you that. They had no idea there was a cross that was going to come. Neither did Abraham understand the cross. Moses didn't understand the cross. The cross was, uh, was an enigma. It, why? Because the cross wasn't even known to people before the Roman Empire became... Uh, the, the, the cross became a method of death in the Roman Empire. How could they know about a cross when it wasn't even used? Ridiculous. But the work of Christ on the cross was prefigured in many different ways throughout the Old Testament. We call it progressive revelation. God didn't give everything to Adam and Eve. But throughout the Old Testament, He revealed more and more and more and more until when we came to when he comes to uh, Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 53 reveals the magnificent picture of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ even before the the cross was a means of torture death it's it's amazing so you know that it was God breathed it had to be God breathed but uh, and salvation has been always faith in the second person of the Godhead as he was revealed 
but always unearned and undeserved by grace. I have, some people have been with me a long time. No, I, I, I went to a Bible conference one time, uh, and uh, the, the man spent the whole time criticizing the Schofield Reference Bible, C.I. Schofield, and painting the picture that dispensationalists believe in salvation by uh, works, uh, by, by living up to whatever the test was in the seven dispensations. And when I confronted him afterwards, that he was, he was deceitful and presenting lies completely and consistently, and that he was misrepresenting completely what the dispensationalist believes, and I had my Schofield Bible with me, and I turned very quickly to the note that C.I. Schofield had written, that salvation has always been and always will be by grace and by grace alone. The dispensationalist does not teach that there are different ways of salvation in different times. The dispensationalist teaches that if you are going to interpret the Bible in the literal sense, then you are going to have to understand that there are different revelations of the plan of God at different periods of time. And that uh, that is only those, each one are tests, in each dispensation, it, can a dispensation, as I pointed out, is this word. O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A. Oikonomia. Oikos is household. Namas is the word for law. It's the law of the household. The world is considered a household. And God gives a specific test to the world of his household. Man is put to the test. Man fails every test. And every house, every dispensation, every period ends in some kind of judgment. Whether it's expulsion from the garden, a universal flood, uh, the patriarchs being in slavery in Egypt, uh, or the uh, fifth cycle of discipline administered to the Jews. Whatever it is, each dispensation ends with some kind of a judgment that falls upon the world for failure to live up to the test that God has outlined. But the test is simply how man would operate the earth during that period of time. It had nothing to do with salvation. Salvation has always been by means of grace, through faith. Now, since we have these two groups, you have the covenant and the dispensationalist, what is the major difference then as far as literal interpretation of Scripture? Well, if you don't believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture, such as all dispensationalists do, then you must do what they do. They spiritualize the Scripture. To spiritualize Scripture means this. See, the literal interpretation simply says this, that when God invented language, He meant for words to be understood, and words have meaning, and words are to be, to, to be understood in their normal usage, their normal meaning. Now, uh, language does change at different places and at different times, but the words are meant to be understood in the historical context of when they were spoken. Now, what the, the, what, what the people who are going to spiritualize Scripture are going to say, they say this, well, uh, see, the, the church was existed in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the church was called Israel. In the New Testament, the church is called the church. But it's just one church. And to the Old Testament Israel, there are given certain prophecies, and there are certain promises which are given. And they say all of these have been fulfilled already. And there's only one way that you can make these prophecies and promises fulfilled, and that is to take the normal teaching of what is said in the Scripture and cause it to be spiritualized. That is, have the words mean something that they do not mean, that hidden underneath these words are spiritual meanings, are uh, myster mysteric, uh, mystical meanings that are hidden, and uh, that the job of the pastor is to seek to, to dig down into there and to bring and to spiritualize uh, uh, those things and to bring out spiritual lessons from the, 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 uh, the Scripture that is, that is uh, written. Uh, and so you can do all kinds of despot to Scripture, and they have done some terrible things to the Word of God, to the Old Testament. If you understand, however, that what God says He means, and He spoke to Israel, 
and that Israel at the time of the cross was set aside. God stopped dealing with Israel and on the day of Pentecost picked up a brand new uh, organism called church. And that what he said to Israel will be fulfilled in the future. Israel, however, is on hold. Israel is being set aside and prophecies and promises which are made to Israel will be fulfilled. In the meantime, we have what is called an intercalation. The intercalation is known as the church age. Began at the day of Pentecost and lasts until the day of the rapture of the church. This church age is so unique and so different that uh, you must understand the uniqueness of the church age for you to understand that there are things that are on the earth and available to believers today that have never been available to believers in all of human history in the past and once the church is taken out in the rapture these things will never again be available to the human race this church is something which is very very special we have studied it uh, as the mystery or the mysterion. Uh, uh, the, the mystery is not mysterious. It's a sacred secret which God has kept in the past from all Old Testament believers. It was revealed only to the apostles, even the New Testament prophets who were apostles, including the 12th apostle who was the apostle Paul, and he had special revelation. And we studied Ephesians chapter 3 on two occasions now to notice this very distinct uh, difference uh, that God had given this information, this unique information. Now there are the next point that we deal with in this, uh, under this second point, the distinction between Israel and the church, is a very important principle. I, I hesitate. I know I have taught this before, and I have. Uh, I was thinking today that uh, maybe I should give a test first, uh, not to take, it, uh, not that I would take it and check it out and see who passes it but so that you would find out how much you learned about the uniqueness of the church age. And I said, nuts, who cares? I don't care if they all pass it. They're going to get it again. Because it is a doctrine that you need to know. And you need to understand it. So I'm going to teach you the uniqueness of the church age. There, this period of time between the, the Pentecost and the rapture is so different. That's the reason that you aren't going to find it in the Old Testament. And you, if you go back to the Old Testament, you may look for illustrations that you could use, but you've got to be careful because the actual facts are not there. Well, one example might be and I'm not going to exegete it for you, but I'm just going to illustrate, show you how it's used as an illustration. As we come to the conclusion of the book of James, James uh, uh, uses a fantastic illustration. Uh, he says, um, he talks about, is any sick, uh, uh, is any, if, is, uh, I'm looking at James 5, 13. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any of you sick? Let him call for the pastor of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil. Now, let me quickly add that the word anoint there is not an ordinary word for anoint. It means to massage. And the, uh, since we, you now have others to massage, pastors don't massage with oil today. Uh, uh, at least this one doesn't. Uh, the, uh, the, the, there was a method, it was a method of uh, uh, physical uh, therapy to people before uh, they understood anything about making him well. Uh, maybe it's, it's, it's as close to chiropractic as you'll come, Doc, uh, in, the, in the Bible, uh, when he, uh, they, if you massage the, the, in the right places. Okay, anyway, uh, then he says, The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sins, if, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Then the illustration comes in verse 17. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, you have to understand, that some people say, ah, see, it, the Bible authorizes prayer for rain. That's not what that says at all. What does that say? It says this, that 
Elijah prayed according to the revealed will of God. That's what that says. Elijah knew that judgment was coming upon his nation. And according to the will of God, judgment on an agrarian society was the withholding of rain or depression. And Paul, he, he prayed for the economic depression to come so that King Ahab would learn his lesson. And that happened. In other words, all that says is that he prayed uh, in accordance with the will of God. And then he realized once the test at Mount Carmel was over and the people made their choice, that it was now time for the, the uh, judgment to end and the drought to be over. And so he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain. It doesn't mean, therefore, that you pray for rain or you don't pray for rain. That have, you don't do that in this dispensation. The believer, as a matter of fact, if you, the more you understand the relationship that you have with the Heavenly Father as, you're, as a member of His royal family, the, I'm going to tell you, make a startling statement, the less you pray the more you trust. Why? It's just exactly like a, a, a child. A child who has a, a fantastic confidence in the parent realizes that the parent will do what is best for him. What, what do you have to teach you that God, your Heavenly Father, has your best interest in mind? And is there any among you who would ever dare to think that the God of Heaven the God who gave us the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who provided salvation when you were still enemies and aliens, will do anything but the best thing in the world for you under any circumstance? Do you think that that could change? Obviously, the more you know about Him, the less you have to worry about asking Him or telling Him to do anything. The more you simply te tell Him, Father, I'm trusting you, for I, I don't have the slightest idea what's best for me. I don't know it's better for me, for my mother, that she should live. Maybe it's better she should die. I want to I recommend, if you haven't heard it, Garth Brooks is a, one, of the, the, one of the leading country singers these days. Now, I don't often recommend country music. To me, it's C&W, corny and wretched, but this is good. It's, it's, I don't know the name of it, but my, our daughter and son-in-law played it for me over the weekend when we were taking Dan down, we took some stuff down to Dan at school. And he sings about unanswered prayer. And it's fantastic. He sings about the story that goes uh, that he was going to a class reunion. And he was going to see the girl that he prayed God would give him when he was in school. He prayed and prayed and said to God, give me this magnificent, this beautiful, this wonderful woman. She's just the most fantastic thing that ever walked on shoelace. And he said, look what I'm stuck with. He's got his wife there, you see, with him. And then they go to the reunion. And he sees her. And the chorus the starts, Lord, thank you for an unanswered prayer. I wouldn't want her for a million years. And he looks over at his wife and he says, Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I didn't pray for her, but you gave her. I prayed for her. You didn't give her. Praise the Lord. That's what it is. That's all about it. And I thought there couldn't be a better illustration. What a tremendous illustration. I'm going to find out what it is. Maybe we'll sing it here. <laughs> I don't know. Because I haven't heard a better prayer hymn in my life. Tremendous. Aren't we delighted when God doesn't do what we think He should do when it's not best for us? Who would want some witch that God said isn't going to destroy your life, you nitwit? Oh, God, give her to me. Give her to me. If I were God, I would. So I could have a good laugh. But He's not that way. He's the God of grace and God of love and mercy and tenderness. And He's not going to do something for you. Illustration. If a man asks a, a snake uh, 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 for a... Uh, 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 bread? Will he give him a scorpion? Will he give us a, uh, a snake to uh, in answer to a request? Of course not. You just re relax. Just trust your heavenly Father. And the more, the more you you know Him, the more you trust. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by. That's how we do it. We walk by what faith. We walk by confidence in who and what He is. But uh, uh, we don't worry about. Uh, prayer changes things. Hogwash. Who wants to change the plan of God? If the plan of God calls for me to die tomorrow, God, God said to Hezekiah, you're going to die. Get your things in order, you're going to die. 
And all Hezekiah turned over and he prayed, Lord, I don't want to die. Please give me more years. And God gave him 15 more years. And he lived to regret those 15 years. It was those years during which he, in his arrogance, showed off the treasuries to the Chaldeans as they came by. And they saw dollar signs as they went past. And they came back and collected later on. It was during those 15 years that his son Manasseh was born. The worst king that ever reigned on the throne of Judah was Manasseh. He did more damage in his short reign than his father did in his long reign. He was a horrible king. True, he was converted at the end of his life, but he could never undo everything that he did. I'm simply saying that, you see, we must be very careful to understand some things. All right, let's look at some of these, the uniqueness of the church age. And the first thing is the object of a great deal of confusion by a great many people, and that is that the, something that has never happened before and never will happen again is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, for that, I have asked you to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, in fact, in fa chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, we read these words. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, yet they form one body, one unit. So it is with Christ. So we have the analogy which is drawn now. Now verse 13, for we were all baptized, notice the word all, not some, not a few super spiritual believers, not a few people who asked for it, not a few people who practiced uh, how to speak in tongues, all is the word that's used there, and it's definitely in the original Greek. We were all, and then it says, baptized. And we'll come back to that. By one spirit, this is the Holy Spirit. And what is the result? Into one body. Now, and we're all given to drink of that one spirit, that same spirit. Now, you see, once again we face the problem of the aorist passive indicative of the Greek, form, Greek word baptizo. B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. What does the word mean? It's not, it's transliterated from the Greek into the English. It's not translated. So, we think of what does baptism mean? Or what does it mean, baptizo, the Greek, the verb form? Well, as we study the word, we, we could, from a superficial standpoint, come up with a superficial de uh, definition that it means to place into. And that would suffice, but that's not true. That's not what it means. It's close, but it's not what it means. For you see, the illustrations which are given would be um, when a, a, a ship is sailing on the sea and it sinks, ah, you see, it is placed into the water. Well, it's already in the water. It goes beneath the water. So, ah, now we're getting close to immersion. That's what it means. No? They have a swimmer who drowns. He uh, goes down under the water. You have a sword of the, of the um, soldier, and it is thrust into a pitcher of blood before he goes out to kill the enemy, that's about baptizo. Say, well, see, it's placing into, placing into. Well, it's used of a city which is placed, is on the verge of destruction. Ah, uh, you see, place into destruction. Mm, boy, all these things. Very, very interesting. No, no, the word means to identify with. Now, how the identification is taking place, that's, that's generally speaking. See, the ship is identified with the water as it sinks. The swimmer becomes identified with the water as he drowns. The sword is identified with blood as, he, uh, as, these, as these, the warrior puts it in the blood. The city is identified with destruction. It's identification. 
It is an identification word. And the, it is the identifying, it is taking one thing and identifying it with something else. And what happens in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply this, that God, the Holy Spirit, takes the believing sinner and identifies that sinner with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this, when he identifies him, he places the believer into Christ, which is called, from this point on, positional truth. The believer is identified as being in Christ, and over 135 times in the New Testament, we read about the believer in Christ, in the Beloved One, and we are in Him, uh, and uh, uh, this is vitally important. See, uh, People will read uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. He is a new creation. And so, they, uh, they, that's what King James says. Uh, he is a new, cre a, a new creature, King James says. Um, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so at the mission, they get up and they say, I was a drunkard. I was no good. I beat my wife. I, I drank a quart and a half of booze a day, but the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I thank God I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. Well, now, that's an interesting testimony, but that's not what this verse says at all. First place, there's no, third, there's no if clause in this verse. It says, it really starts off, since any man, no verb, in Christ, position, this, is, this tells us about, since anyone in Christ, if you're going to put the verb, put it here, is a new creation. New, and the word really means new species of creation, the Greek. The old position, which was in Adam, and in Adam all die, old things are passed away. That's what's passed away. Not some former behavior. If that verse says what it appears to say in the King James Version, the moment you're saved, everything would be changed. And that's not true for anybody. The all, things aren't, doesn't belong there, the all has become new in species. It's again thing. And so it's positional truth. It's in Christ. Always look for that in Christ. That identifies it. We are accepted in the Beloved One, in Christ. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of the seven works of God the Holy Spirit which takes place for every believer of the church age, regardless of who they are or where they are, at the point of salvation. In which that believer is placed into union with Jesus Christ, his new position described in John 14, 20, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am in the Father, and ye in me. Here's Jesus Christ in God the Father, and ye, believer, in me. So that whichever direction God the Father looks to see the believer, he sees him in Jesus Christ. He doesn't see your relative righteousness. He doesn't see your sinfulness. He sees you clothed in the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And 1 Corinthians 12 explains very clearly by we were all, uh, we use the word identified with Christ by one spirit into this one body, which is the church. Whether it's Jew or Greek, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. We are no longer different. So there are several things which, which are going to be changed. And so 
We'll take a few sub points here. Uh, underneath uh, this uh, uh, B, uh, B1, B is the uniqueness of the church age. Uh, and uh, the first uh, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, let us make sure we understand that this is not an ecstatic. You see, the charismatic movement says that when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, the sign of that is you will speak in other tongues. And that it is something that takes place subsequent to or after you're saved. Somewhere after you're saved. And that it is evidenced by this ecstatic experience. And uh, you want to seek this experience, this tongues experience. And uh, if you want to, uh, they'll tell you how you can seek it. But you must understand <laughs> that it is not an ecstatic. It is not an experience. It's not something that you can hear. It is not an emotion. You don't feel it. There is nothing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you feel. It's something that takes place, and if you didn't know it from Scripture, you would never know it. So therefore, it is revealed only in the Word of God. It never gets any better. It's not something that gets better and better. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is as great and wonderful the day you have it as the day you die and go to heaven. You'll, it'll be yours forever. It never improves in time or eternity. And you receive it in toto the moment you're saved. Boy, this is a wonderful thing, therefore. Now, if you don't feel a thing, how do you know it takes place? How do you know you're saved? Are you looking for some emotion? Are you looking for some sign to tell you that you're saved? There are 40 things that happen to you at the point of salvation. And you don't feel one of them. Not one of them do you feel. There are some people who go through all their life wanting this, this feeling of salvation. This feeling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that is not the case. So what... It is, uh, however, as I've already defined it, the, the uh, work of God the Holy Spirit in placing the believer into union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that moment on, you are a, uh, a member of, and the second point is, this is how God build, forms something that is unique, and that is His royal family also known as the church with a capital C, also known as the body of Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, Israel was at some places and called the family of God, never the royal family. Peter tells us we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Uh, Revelation chapter 1 tells us that we are a kingdom of priests. We are royalty, royal family. And uh, you see how it works out uh, is that this has never happened before. The, uh, the day of Pentecost was the first time there was any member of the royal family. The day of Pentecost was the first day there was any member of the church of Jesus Christ. The day of Pentecost was the first day that there was any member of the body of Jesus Christ. And the body will become the bride of Christ when we go to heaven after the rapture of the church. So it is something that is unique to this age, and the finest Old Testament saint never had anything to do with it because it is a grace operation and doesn't depend upon how good or how bad anybody is. It's how we become royal family of God. Now, there are two prophecies regarding this. One is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. We've already noticed it, but I want you to, to, to see it in this context. The Lord Jesus Christ 
says in John 14, 15, or 14, 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, the word another is another of the same kind, alas, another of the same kind of parakletos, another helper, another uh, encourager, another uh, uh, helper, uh, they call it counselor, uh, a New American Standard translates it helper, which is the better translation. Another helper, that he may be with you, please notice, to the end of the age, it says in the Greek, to the ice uh, ton Iona, to the end of the age, and the New International translates it forever. Then he's described, verse 17, the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will, see, he will be where? In you. You see the difference? He's with you now, Old Testament. But at, after Pentecost, he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, verse 19. But you'll see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, and there's a prophecy of that day, the day of Pentecost. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That is the first prophecy that is made of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the second one is made in Acts chapter 1. Just before the, he leaves to, to go with the, uh, the uh, to go to uh, ascend to the Heavenly Father and sit down at the right hand of God the Father, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, they just see that they're slow. They don't understand exactly what's ta uh, talk what they're talking about. Well, and uh, so there they keep wanting to know uh, different things. But in verse 5, he says this. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And really, with should be translated by means of. It's instrumental case, by means of the Holy Spirit. You will be identified with me by means of uh, the Holy Spirit. Those are the two prophecies. The only prophecies that are found anywhere in Scripture and were fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when uh, God the Holy Spirit came upon people. Now, there are, there are a number of results of the baptism of the Holy Spirit which are absolutely fantastic. So, uh, sub E are some results of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, understand is it is the extension of the great power experiment of the hypostatic union. Now, you know what that means, don't you? All right, let me explain it quickly. When the Lord Jesus Christ, who was always deity, was born on that first Christmas day, he added humanity to his always existing deity. But the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ never mixed, thus the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Bill and I were chatting the other day, and he said he never understood how, for all the years in the ministry and he's been... He never understood how the Lord Jesus Christ could be tempted in all points like as we are if he was the God-man. For he never understood the doctrine of the hypostatic union. And if you do not understand the doctrine of the hypostatic union, you cannot understand that statement. I mean, if his deity could help his humanity, there was, there's no contest. How could he be tempted like you and me? He's God. And underneath his humanity is, is his deity. Holding him up and strengthening him. Ah, but that's, that's, that is the heretical doctrine of the hypostatic union. For his deity never spilled over to help his humanity. The doctrine of kenosis says that his deity and his humanity never mixed. And what he, what he did was lay aside or limit the independent exercise of his deity strictly to the plan of God. And when God wanted to help his humanity, God invented a prototype 
not an airplane, but a prototype sphere of power. And he turned that prototype sphere of power over to the humanity of Christ, so that for 33 years, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit or controlled by the Spirit, even out from his mother's womb, for 33 years, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his humanity, never once depended on his deity. See, that was the temptation of Satan. Satan came and said, all right, since you're God, turn the stones into bread. That would have been the exercise of his deity to help his humanity, which would have been exercising his deity outside the plan of God. Couldn't do that. So he rebuked Satan. Cast yourself off from the pinnacle of the temple and the angels, he even quotes scriptures, the angels will keep you from falling. But that would have been the exercise of his deity to help his humanity. Couldn't do that. He never once did it. How did he resist temptation? How did he have the power uh, and the physical strength to carry on the ministry that he carried on? How did he uh, do everything that he did? By the power that God provided for him, the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit plus the omnipotence of the Word of God. That was the great power experiment. God said, now it's never happened before in human history. I'm going to provide a special spirit of power. It's just like, uh, you know, if you had a, uh, if I were to uh, reach in and say, now, here it is, this is, an, this is a, a, a prototype of a, a little piece that uh, you take this and you will be a Superman from now on. But I don't know that it's going to work. I better give it a test somewhere and I'll prove it first. So I take the wrapper, I'll eat it myself and suddenly I can, I'm a Superman. I'm the prototype. Work for me? Now I say, here, they can all have one. But I'm not going to throw them out. I'm saving them for later. <laughs> but um, see what I'm saying? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ put it to the test. It was the power experiment. And when he finished, he says, it works. And so he turns the prototype into the operational type, and he turns it over to who? A special group of people, a unique group of people called the royal family. And only the royal family. Nobody else gets this this, this sphere of power that makes it possible to resist all kinds of temptation, to have even be crucified and hang on a cross and say, Father, forgive them. That was not from his deity. That was his humanity sustained by the great power of God, the Holy Spirit, that made him take the, the most cruel, horrible death and turn it around into a great victory. The result of this now is that we, as members of the royal family of God, have received a unique sphere of power wherein we, as royal family, can execute the plan of God, just as our Lord Jesus Christ received power so that he could execute the plan of God for his life. Remember, any face of temptations. Okay, see, so he said to the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. Peter said, oh, be it far from thee, Lord. And the, his, how could he say, get thee behind me, Satan, for you savor not the things of man, uh, God, but the things of men. You, you like human viewpoint. How could he do that? How could he resist all of the temptations? Remember who he was. Yet, he never ever exercised his power outside of the plan of God. He executed the plan of God, and when it says it came time for him to go to the cross, he set his face like a flint. It's an, an old idiom which means he, was, he, he just set his jaw and he went to the cross. And by the way, in the garden, he was not praying that his death should be taken away. He was praying that he would not die in the garden by the attack of Satan, for the blood came through his pores just exactly like sweat. Satan was trying to take his life prematurely. Satan wanted him not to go to the cross. Satan had to keep him from the cross at all costs. And he, he prayed that this cup, the, 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 the fantastic thing that was happening to him right then and there, would pass. Not that the cup of the cross. He set his face like a flint to go to the cross. For this cause I was born, he said. He, know, he knew exactly where he went. And he could face all of those things. 
without flinching, without in any way uh, batting an eye, saying, oh, not me, Lord. He took it all, and he passes it on to us so that we can live this superhuman way of life. So that is the, the first result of the uniqueness of this church age, a power sphere that is so tremendous and so great that those of us who are ordinary people, ordinary human beings, can live an extraordinary life, not by means of human effort, but by means of supernatural power. What a tremendous... This is a great salvation, folks. It's a great salvation, and we thank God for it. Let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege which is ours of being in the royal family of God. Thank you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for what it means to us and all the many results which we shall continue to look at in future classes. But for us to know that we are members of the royal family of God and recipients of the operational type sphere of power in which we can live our lives as our own palace, the, the, the divine dinosphere, where we can live and move and have our being. Oh, it's wonderful. For this is the wonderful life that you've called upon us to live and provided for us to live by. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Howard, I need to see you for one minute before the meeting. Uh